Well, good morning, everyone. Before we go any further, I just want to say happy anniversary to my wife. She's going to embarrass her today. I'm so grateful that 12 years ago you agreed to marry me. So, really grateful. Uh, let's begin with reading Romans 12, 3 through 8. It says, For the, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. And if it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is in giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So right now we have been going through really this passage as a foundation for us to talk about spiritual gifts, a gift that God gives his church for the betterment of his people and for his own glory. If you're a Christ follower today, God's desire is to use you. If you're a Christ follower today, then the God's spirit has given you a gift to be used for his church. Now, so far in here, we've, we've just done this for a couple weeks, we've looked at prophecy, teaching, service, and mercy. Now, you'll remember just as a recap real fast, prophecy is not about future telling, but it's about proclaiming a timeless message in a timely way. Teaching is all about exploring and explaining the depths of scripture. Service is about meeting practical needs, and mercy is about care and concern being lived out. Well, today we're going to add to that conversation by looking at two more spiritual gifts. We're going to look at encouragement and administration. Now, in the passage that we read, administration would be the one where it says, if it is to lead, do it uh, diligently. But we're going to start with encouragement. Let's, let's, let's talk about encouragement for a minute. If we are to be the people that God has called us to be as Trinity Baptist Church right here on this corner, if this group right here, if we are to be the people that God wants us to be and accomplish the task that God has for us, we have to make encouragement just a natural and a regular part of our lives. We have to be practicing this gift. So let me ask you this. Do you know someone, do you have someone in your life whom after spending time with them, you walk away refreshed, filled with courage, ready to take on whatever it is the Lord is calling you to? But I hope that that is true. And here's the, the, the really, the, I guess, the admonition for the day is if God has particularly gifted you with the spiritual gift of encouragement, you got to use it because we need it. We all need it. This is such a great need. Now, if we think about some of the different places in scripture where it talks about encouragement, we've got some really great examples in both the Old and the New Testament. Let me read uh, starting in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what Paul wrote, and this is the source of our encouragement. We're going to look at two things about the source of it. You ready? He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since we have what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What Paul's trying to get us to see here is that we, there, we all go through trials and there, there are tons of things that happen in our life, but the source of our encouragement, the thing that produces encouragement within us is when, in the midst of those trials, we fix our eyes on the Lord, when we focus on the Lord. That is the source of our encouragement. Every single person is gonna face hardship and when that comes into your life, like nobody's trying to say that following Christ means that you're gonna have a super easy life with never any difficulties. That's not what scripture teaches. But rather what scripture teaches is that when you find yourself in that place, if you fix your eyes on Christ, it will be a source of encouragement. When we do that, we discover that he has the power to transform us and to use the very difficulties that we're in to shape us and then later to sustain us through every season of life. Now in the Old Testament, this is a, a passage that you're likely familiar with, but in Isaiah 40, 
This is what the scripture says. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So fixing our eyes on the Lord is certainly a source of our encouragement. The other thing that this passage tells us is that we hope in the Lord. That we have to anchor our hope when we go through these difficulties in life, when we go through every season of life. The thing that produces, that is a source of encouragement for me, is when I have anchored myself to the truth of God's word and set my hope in him and him alone. I mean, just look at this passage. Do you feel tired? Do you feel weary? Do you feel like you might stumble and fall? Then find hope in the Lord. Make the choice to anchor yourself to him and to him alone. So let me ask you this. How do you know if someone needs encouragement? I've said this before. This is not new material, okay? An easy test is this. Look at them, and if they're breathing, assume they need encouragement, right? <laughs> like, that's it. it and of course, it's, it's, it's a bit hyperbolic because the truth is this. We all need encouragement. We all do. Every moment of every day, this is, and this is such a wonderful gift because from time to time, man, the Lord will use people just to breathe into your spirit, uh, when I first came to Trinity back in 2016, Pastor Steve began to mentor some of the younger ministers on staff. And one of our first uh, times with him, I remember this, he told us, and this is cute, right? That we needed to create a smile file. A smile file. So, yes, sir, got it. So I've created me a smile file. And the, the purpose of a smile file, he said, is when you get a note, when you get a card, when you get an email, and somebody is encouraging you, save it. Print it out, don't lose it, put it in that smile file. So you can go back to it and pull it out. Because there's days, even days in ministry, where you just need a little pick-me-up. He said, you'll, you'll want that smile file. And uh, for all the disparaging notes, those go into a different file. File 13, you may know about that one. <laughs> but let's look at some biblical examples. If you're thinking about encouragement, there is one name, there's many names, but there's at least one that certainly leaps off the, the page for us. It's the man Barnabas. His name actually means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. That's very fitting, right? So listen to what it says in Acts 11. Acts 11 says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. I pray that the Lord will bring a Barnabas into your life, someone who can come alongside you and encourage you. Uh, in Acts 14, it's still Barnabas. Here's another example. But before I read Acts 14, you got it. Let me give you just a little context. This is a crazy story. The book of Acts is, is a tremendous book. If you're, if you're like, well, what do I read next? Go, go to Acts, read it. Um, in this passage, the people, they thought that Paul and Barnabas, they thought they were gods in human form. And so they begin to come to them. They throw themselves at their feet. They worship, they sacrifice to them. And, and Paul and Barnabas are like, whoa, whoa hold on. <laughs> Not true. We're just fellas. And uh, and so they, they tell him and they, they encourage him and they admonish him, you need to turn from this worthless thinking and turn to the Lord. Seek God. And um, just it's action packed. And then what happens next is the scripture records that a, a, a group comes into town from another town, a, a, a group of dissenters, opposition, and they stir up the crowd. And this crowd that was formerly worshiping them now is trying to kill them. And in fact, it says that they stoned Paul and they left him for dead. And Paul doesn't die. He gets up and he walks, walks back into town. And then this is what it says. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. 
Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So besides just being a wild story about Barnabas, there's one, one very specific thing that I want you to see. This was just a pattern of their life. Apparently they saw encouragement as a part of discipleship. They saw encouragement as a natural form of maturing in the Lord and helping others to do the same. They encouraged the people to remain true to the faith. That's discipleship. That's walking with people and encouraging them in this way. Now, you may not be stoned and left for dead. That may not happen. But here's the truth. In order to persevere, you will need encouragement. In order to live out the Christian life, you need the encouragement that comes from godly brothers and sisters that God has called you to join with. Now, you may also not find yourself in this next situation um, as is recorded in uh, the book of 2 Chronicles 32. This is a little bit different. They had an invading army coming in, but I really love this story. I want you to hear it. Um, Yeah, so listen to this, and then I'm gonna explain the life jacket. Did you notice that earlier? We'll talk about it next. But listen to 2 Chronicles. It says, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sinchurib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sinacherib had come and that he intended to wage war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard repairing the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that one and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is no greater power, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. And so I I just love this story. It's really just meant to to see the power of our words. That in the face of death, he encouraged the people and it made all the difference. All right, let's, let's talk about the life jacket. You ready? So last week I had a couple of props. I thought I would try one more time. So this here is a life jacket. You're supposed to go, oh. Exactly. So many of you are very familiar with a life jacket. Let me tell you a little story. So earlier this year, we took a family vacation and we found ourselves on a beach. It was great. Uh, we left the baby at home, but we had our two oldest daughters with us. And out in the water was um, the, like, kind of like inflatables for the land, but they were like floating out there. So it was like a water obstacle course. It was really cool. And, uh, and so we were enjoying that. And my oldest daughter, she's eight. She's a very, very good swimmer. Very strong. She does a little swim team in the summer. Like she's just really good. We're really thankful for that. And so we told her, they have life jackets on the beach, but you don't have to wear one. Like, we trust you. We know you're good. We're going to be watching. We'll be there with you. You don't have to wear. So no surprise, she didn't wear one. Neither did I. I mean, it's not like she did anything bad there. She just, you know, she's doing the deal. Well, a little bit later, I noticed that she's swimming back to the beach and she comes back with a life jacket. And uh, I said, well, why did you go get the life jacket? And she said, well, you know, I didn't really need it, but the water was just a little choppy. And so I thought, you know, it'd be nice. You know, just a little boost. Like maybe you spent time on the lake and, you know, just kind of relaxing in a life jacket. And it's true, the water was kind of choppy. And so for her, it was just a little pigman, just a little help because the water was getting just a little rough. But maybe you've been there and you know that there's actually situations when a life jacket is more than just a pick me up. It actually will save your life. When the water is raging, this is the very thing that can keep you from drowning. See where I'm going with this? Let me, let me explain it like this. When we offer encouragement into people's lives, we don't know if they're just in water that's just a little choppy 
and, it, and maybe they need just a little pick me up. Or maybe they are in the middle of a storm and this is the thing that God is using to keep their head above water. Like we don't know that. We don't know that when we look into other people's lives, but yet we are called to use the gift of encouragement like a life jacket that says, here you go. And so remember what we said, we have to be a people who are generously offering encouragement because we don't know what the water's like in their heart, but we have this chance. So that's the life jacket. Now, before we move on from encouragement, there's two more things I wanna talk about for encouragement. You ready? First is how to, and then the second is the foundation. So let's talk about how to give encouragement. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. How to offer encouragement. Number one, be sincere. Right? <laughs> like be sincere. People can tell whether you mean it or not. For me in my life, I, I mean, I'm thankful to get a kind word, but if it's just an empty platitude or cliche, it just doesn't do much. You know that, you can see through that too. But when someone's being genuine with you and they genuinely or sincerely offering you encouragement, that's a game changer, right? You've, you've seen that? We have the chance to be that for other people. The second thing is this, you have to be specific. So we got sincere, be specific. Man, it always means more when you're specific. When you can, we can give some details in that. When you see something and you say something, I'm just trying to help us be a, a, a group of people that know how to encourage one another. For example, this is not hypothetical. This is legitimate. Let me just say this. Kenny in the back is running slides right now. Don't look at him right now. But he's back there. Kenny, you do a great job, man. I'm really thankful for you. Like, that's true. And I hope Kenny is encouraged by that. But if I could just open up my heart, let me say this. Kenny, thank you so much for always being here early, for running through the songs with the tech team, for being willing to adjust all my spelling mistakes and for working so hard to make sure things work good and being flexible to change things and, and restart things and enter things. And, and man, your willingness to serve is a blessing to every single person here and I'm grateful for it. So I mean that, that's my dude, like he's great. And I hope that when we are specific with encouragement, that it goes past his ears all the way to his heart. And I hope that you will do that for one another too. So be specific, be specific. And the third thing is this, be spiritual. Be spiritual with your encouragement. It's okay, it's okay. I'm not seeing anybody in here does this, but I can see there a temptation and I have heard it before where people will say, you know, I, I kinda wanted to say something to them, but I didn't want to sound too churchy, you know what I mean? Hey, church, we are a church. Like, don't apologize for being spiritual. And I'm not getting on to you. I'm just saying, like, that's the mindset we've got to have. Let's never apologize for being what we are, spiritual. Send the Bible verse. It's okay. Like, offer to pray for them. Like, do this. Be spiritual. Why? Because the foundation of our encouragement is the gospel. Like that is the foundation of why we can encourage one another is because of the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel, that's what it is. If you've heard that language, let me explain it. The gospel is the good news of what God has done through Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners who don't deserve it. God has done for me and for you what we could have never done for ourselves. He sent Jesus, he lived a perfect life, he died a terrible death and he rose again in victory and now we can have salvation. Because Christ has paid the price and he's inviting us into relationship with him. And because of the gospel, here's the foundation. Because of the gospel, there are several things that are true about us now as Christ followers. If you're taking notes, write this down. Because of the gospel, our encouragement, let me say it like this. What the gospel provides for us is freedom from our past. That's why we can encourage one another. Because I don't know the details of your past, but I know Christ paid for it. So you can have freedom from your past because of the gospel. You, because of the gospel, what, another thing it provides for us is power for the present. Power for right here, right now. I don't know what you're facing, but I know that in Christ there is power. The, the, the scripture says the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available and to us. So, so we get to live in that. And the other thing is this, nothing can separate us now from the love of Christ. 
And so we have power for this very moment. And then thirdly, because of the gospel, what the gospel provides for us is a hope for the future. Hope for the future. Guys, to say it plainly, Jesus wins. He wins and he invites us to be with him forever. And so I'm not trying to minimize any storm that you may be going through, but here's the truth. We have a hope for the future. And if you're thinking, man, I don't know if I could receive encouragement. I don't know if I could give encouragement because maybe you're hung up on one of these things. Maybe it's your past that's got you hung up. I I don't know if I could ever be forgiven. Maybe it's right now that's got you tripping. I, I just don't know if I'm gonna make it through this very moment. Maybe it's uncertainty about the future that keeps you up at night. I, I don't know, but I know that the gospel covers all of it. The gospel covers all of it. You can have freedom from the past, power for right here, right now, and a hope for the future. Therefore, I get to say this, man, be encouraged. I know that's not specific, which I just told you to be specific, but we can find encouragement in the gospel. And we can give encouragement because of these truths. Now let's look at the gift of administration. This is a gift of leading. Here's a good working definition, okay? So if you wanna write this down, here's a working definition. The spiritual leadership ability that God gives to some so that they can visualize, analyze, and organize spiritual matters. That's what administration is all about. It's about using this gift to put things in place. I find it very interesting that this gift can actually be used in a variety of settings. Someone can use it in the home. Someone can use it in a business. You can certainly use it in the church. You can use it in other organizations. But no matter where it is used, it always results in the same thing. Glory to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can look up 12, 28 later. Paul refers to the same gift with a word that is translated into English as guidance the spiritual gift of guidance. And the word used there is used to refer to the captain of a ship. And so it carries the idea that this is the gift of someone who has the ability to lead and to lead others. And the truth is, no church or organization can operate to its highest efficiency without those who possess and exercise this gift of administration. For example, take Trinity Baptist Church. I am so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for the things that God has given us. But we do have a, a lot of resources, a lot of, a lot of great, like we're here in the North venue, they're there in the Central venue, we've got a Spanish congregation on the other side, like God has given us so much to be used for his glory. And if we did not have people like Keith right here and so many others who work at the church and volunteer at the church, boy, we would be tripping all over ourselves and ministry would not happen. God has called us uniquely to be a light and hope and for the lake area and for the world. And the only hope we have of making a real impact is to have people using their spiritual gift of administration to make sure things are happening. It is absolutely a spiritual practice. Now, think with me about what the Bible teaches about the gift of administration. In 1 Corinthians 14... Paul says that God is not a God of disorder. Other translations say that God is not a God of confusion. Maybe yours says it like that. So we can safely say that order and organization, that they reflect the heart of God. And this is made clear even in the very beginning of scripture. Think back with me to the way the whole thing starts. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. And this this passage goes on. This is a foundational passage for all of theology and what we see is that, that God meticulously and carefully speaks and brings order to what was once formless and void. A major part of what God created here in this universe and set with order is two things. The universe and people. I was trying to think about the best way to illustrate just God's heart here. People and the universe. So in order to do this, I did a little Googling. Did y'all know that that's a phrase? As a result of my research, Googling, I found an interesting article. It's way back from 2012, but it was called this, 13 Incredibly Lucky Earth Facts. (laughs) Let me just read what it said. Not all of it, but here's a couple. Um, Incredibly lucky earth facts, right? That we are the third rock from the sun. 
There's a reason we found life on earth and nowhere else. Our world orbits the sun at just the right distance. Not too hot, not too cold. And this habitable zone is where water can exist in liquid form. A basic requirement of life. Nobody's bragging about their oceanfront property on Mars, right? Uh, It talks about the stable rotation of the earth and says earth's rotation brings the sun up each morning and thankfully puts it back down. And if it weren't for this, one side of the earth would be unbearably scorched and the other would freeze. Then it talks about gravity and it says nobody expects gravity to go anywhere anytime soon, but it's interesting to note that scientists don't really understand how it works. We take it for granted, but gravity helps us make us who we are. It defines our strength and contributes to the shape and form of everything. Then it goes on to talk about uh, a protective magnetic field and says if Earth did not have a strong and relatively stable magnetic field, we'd all be fried by cosmic rays. Because this is just a sampling of what it says. And when, what it calls lucky, I call providential. I call God. And his fingerprints are all over the universe. And, man, we could really nerd out and just talk about tons of facts. We don't have time. But it's there, guys. Think about your own body. Yes, they don't always work perfectly, but here's the deal. God has made the most complex system intricately organized in the human body. Um, Just think about this. You've got the circulatory system. Now, I promised the Lord if he would just get me through science in college. I promised I'd never take another one. But I do remember a few things. There's a lot of these. There's the lymphatic system, the respiratory system, the integumentary system. I had my wife, she's a nurse, she's really smart. I had her pronounce that like six times this morning. Can't get it. The, it's skin, she told me. The endocrine system, the digestive system, the urinary excretory system, the, I know, the, the skeleton system, nervous, reproductive, immune. There's, it is complex. And God has knit it together so that it can form and so that it can function properly, so that we can flourish as his creatures. God, this is something that reflects the heart of God. And when we exercise this spiritual gift, it is no less than a spiritual activity. Now, I want to do another Old Testament uh, scripture that gives us insight into the spiritual gift. Then we'll do one more for the New Testament, then we'll wrap up, okay? This is the story of Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, Moses, uh, Exodus 18 says this. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. And when his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses answered, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to uh, behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves and that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. And Moses listened to his father-in-law, did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones, they decided for themselves. I know it's a lengthy passage, but boy, it's just, it's an example of how God gives his people this gift of administration to take what otherwise would be overwhelming and make it sustainable. And that's the chance that we have, church, when we are using our gifts. God hasn't called everybody to do everything, but what he has called you to do, we've got to do. We've got to exercise it. And there are people with the gift of administration and leading who can take 
situations just like this and move it from overwhelming to sustainable and God will get the glory for it. Now here's the last biblical example, ready? Paul says in Titus chapter one, verse five, he says, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. This letter was written to Titus. He was a young pastor. He was left in Crete. You can look at a map today. Maybe you've got maps in the back of your Bible. This is a perfect chance. Look at Crete. It's an island. And it was a notoriously tough place to plant a church. It said that every Cretan was a liar. I don't know if that's hyperbolic or if it was just, man, wow. But he left him here. And he says, Titus, I I have you here for a reason. The church, this, this island, it needs a church. These people need the gospel. And this is a tough place. So I wanna put you here and you're gonna have to use this spiritual gift to appoint people to help you so that the work of ministry can continue. Guys, that's the gift of administration. That's the gift of encouragement. And here's the truth. God has called us to use our gifts for the glory of God and to impact the lives of people. And so maybe you're here today and you've, Maybe you've devalued your gift. Man, let's not do that. God has given it to you and he wants to use you in it. Now, the most important thing you could hear is this. You cannot exercise a spiritual gift without knowing the giver of the gift. Because if you hear lessons like this and you say, all right, I'm gonna encourage or I'm gonna serve or I'm gonna lead or do all these things, I'm telling you, if you do it, from any other place than a place of relationship with the Lord, any other place that is out of an overflow of of thankfulness for what God has done, what's gonna happen is you're just gonna burn out or you're gonna grow really bitter because God has done for us and it is out of the overflow of what he has done that now we serve. And so I hope and pray that, that we can keep these very clear. What I'm trying to say is this, if you're in the room today and you've never responded to the invitation of Jesus to become a Christian, then this isn't for you. Just put a pen in it. You need to hear this. Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He died a terrible death and he rose again in victory. And he did that for my sin and for yours. And the invitation of Jesus is this. If you will come to him and ask him for forgiveness and quit trying to live for yourself, that he'll bring you into the family and that he'll transform your life. And it'll be just the beginning, but it'll be something that he does in you. And so if you're here, maybe you've been coming for many weeks and you feel the Lord stirring in you, man, let's be obedient to do whatever it is that he's calling you to do. Uh, We're gonna sing. I'm gonna be right here in the front. There'll be other ministers here too. If we can pray for you, you come. Boy, it is always a privilege to pray for God's people. And so if you need someone stand in the gap, that's why we're here. You come, let us join you in prayer. But also, maybe today you're ready. You're ready to take a step of faith. You feel the Lord stirring in your heart. You're ready to become a Christian or ready to to get baptized or ready to join this church. I don't know, but here's what I do know. Whatever God's calling you to do, you don't have to do it alone. That's why we are here. And so we're gonna lift our voice. I pray that the Holy Spirit will take this message, root it deep in your heart, and then call you to live a life of obedience to whatever it is that he's doing in you and through you. Let me pray for you and then we will respond. Father, we say thank you for the day. God, thank you so much for the gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that you would have your hand on Trinity Baptist Church in this moment and the season that we're in. Father, raise up servants, raise up leaders, raise up people who can encourage, who can lead, who can do all these other things that we've talked about so that your word will go forth so that people's lives can be changed, so that we can make a difference for your kingdom. Father, use us. Use us. And Father, we we give you all the glory. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.